So as the last people find their chairs, uh, just a quick announcement. It appears that the coffee machine is broken. And I've, I've dispatched experts to uh, try to rectify it, but uh, it seems they gave us some of the wrong parts, and they're trying to now make do with the parts that they gave us. So hopefully we'll figure that out soon, and I apologize for that. Um, one other announcement. Um, I just wanted to point out that we do have some great cool world prizes. Um, ICOM was nice enough to donate an IC2. 2200H today. So that's what the tickets are for that you got um, with your registration packet. So if you didn't actually find the tickets, you hunt the packet. And uh, there's a coffee can on the front desk to just drop it in, just put your call on one and uh, keep the other one. We'll draw that towards this afternoon. Um, we also have a couple copies of MapPoint that the Microhands group bought for gold prizes. So uh, we'll draw those later today. Since it looks like most people are back, I'd like to introduce Steve Stroh. Any G and C, G and J. Apologize. Um, <laughs> Steve has uh, been a long time uh, ham in the area. Did a lot of work with the original TCP uh, packet network, and uh, I didn't actually know that that uh, um, he worked on the the 9600 baud regen packets for Peters as well. So, uh, without further ado, Steve. for a very long time until Ed just suffered from fatigue and, and, and discontinued it. But Ed and I had a long running discussion via email about the relevance of amateur radio in this century and that it was declining and what could be done. And we didn't come to any conclusions at the time. And I'm not sure I've got conclusions now, but I have some ideas. And again, they've been brewing in me for a long time. And just to kind of set the stage for where I'm at at the moment in my amateur radio career, um, I, I'll tell you just a little anecdote. I used to kind of not quite get it with the guys who would add all the Collins gear, you know, the, the vintage Collins gear that they lovingly restored and maintained and brought on the air. And I never did get that, you know. Why would you put, why would you bother to play with vacuum tubes? and all that stuff in this era, and, you know, and, and bother to get, keep this beer running. I mean, other, it, it looks nice, and you know, there's heritage there, but. So, I was describing lovingly to another friend, Bill Waddell, WI7NWP. I'll leave him safe, semi-safely anonymous. <laughs> and he pointed out, you know, that, you know, my grand plan to put all my TNCs, all the TNCs that I've collected over the years, back on the air, and just, Oh, those are antiques. And I had this blinding flash of insight that here I was trying to do the, the equivalent of the Collins guys in the digital era. And thinking about putting all my TNT, these Z80 little uh, horribly obsolete devices back on the air just because I wanted to, because they meant something to me. And then all of a sudden I, I had an insight about the Collins guys. You know, so I'm of that same era and, and I, you know, I'm kind of want to recreate, at least personally, something of the boring days of, of packet radio, you know, at least in my own uh, little world, and maybe drag a few of you along with me. So, let's see, check out this new wireless. Okay. Um, I won't, these, these are talking points, I won't read them to you. <coughs> Just to give you some history of where, I'm, where I came from and where I'm at, um, I started getting involved in packet radio, not at the beginning, certainly wasn't part of the TNC-1 era, but I was part of the kind of trailing edge of the TNC-2 era, and I started really uh, in packet radio about 1984 or so. And I started in <coughs> Ohio, which literally compared to what you guys saw here in Western Washington was absolutely a backwater. I mean, you guys were experimenting with NetROM and networking and 
you know, multi, multi port digipeters and all that stuff. We were still thinking about BBSs and, you know, forwarding over HF within the state. So, um, when I came out here in 1987, I discovered packet radio for real, you know, what, what was really, really cool. Uh, there was a bit regen repeater, there, you were doing VHF and UHF, dual port, um, Netron, and there was 9600 baud, TCP IP, boy, that got a hold of me. Never let go. Um, we had an internet gateway. That was real radical stuff. In fact, uh, an, inter an interesting vignette, and I'll invoke uh, Ed again. Um, there was an interesting story that um, Microsoft was contemplating doing TCP/IP, putting TCP/IP into Windows for the first time. They weren't sure that it would work on really slow dial-up links. And I think it was Ed that said that pointed out that amateur radio had been able to successfully do this over 1,200 baud half duplex and make TCPIP work. But it was that flexible. So um, one thing I really regret missing is I wish I had been in Vancouver during the glory days of the 56K network. Um, then in 1993, I had an epiphany. Her name was Meredith. She came into the world. And ham radio was really fun, and so was being a geek in techies. But fatherhood, I had Trump. So um, I kind of sat amateur radio out for quite a while until just about now. Um, I so I was I wasn't I was watching it passively the collapse of the packet radio networks because there was more interesting things to do. A guy at work um, said it really well. He said, you know, all the things that I wanted to play around with the packet radio, I can do on the internet now. And I, I couldn't fault it. Um, I, because I had been sitting it out, um, I missed the rise of APRS. I never quite got it. I did. I think I do now, but I, I didn't then. Um, I missed. The, I, I'm still a tech because um, I never really was interested in anything to do with HF. It just wasn't the ready, the 300 watt packet. That wasn't that interesting to me. It is now. I will be upgrading my license very soon now that, now that I'm re-licensed again. Um, and uh, I also watched passively the decline of the Seattle 9600 baud uh, network. <coughs> and I was one of, the, one of the people that caused it because I didn't use it. Again, I was busy raising the dark. What, what I've done since then um, is I've been watching the rise of what are called what I call broadband wireless internet access service providers systems and wireless internet service providers. <coughs> These are guys that do internet service over, over wireless. And they're using, they started off using hacked up Wi-Fi, or what was then the precursors of Wi-Fi, 802.11 here. They now have very, very sophisticated stuff that will blow you guys away. And what's really cool is that um, they're, they're doing it with license exempt spectrum. They're making 2.4 gigahertz work over many miles. It's not a question of whether you can make 2.4 gigahertz or even 5 gigahertz work, how much technology you're willing to throw at the problem. Um, my inspiration for writing about this stuff and following it was the 1996 um, Digital Communications Conference in September that was held right here in the Seattle area. And I sat in on a bunch of talks that talked about this new technology called spread spectrum. And oh my god, that made sense to I me. Mean, it made so much sense to amateur radio, especially frequency hopping spread spectrum. I thought it was a perfect, perfect fit for amateur radio. And there were a few of us that did it. Everybody else didn't get it, the arm went on. Um, if, you just want, if, if you just want the utility of you know, wireless internet, wherever you, or internet, wherever you go, you've got that now. Cellular networks are more than good enough. There are cellular networks that have near 100% coverage, and they've all got at least some basic level of internet connectivity. It might be slow, but it's always there. But, and as, as much as I've seen, and, much as, and I've done a little bit of this in my writing, there's still, it, it's still cool, interesting, and relevant to me to try and do this stuff with damage rating. Again, I haven't done it for a long time. But I'm now in a position with my daughter being 15 and 
sometimes caring that she has a father and sometimes not, <laughs> that I can get away with spending a few amateur time units getting back in amateur radio. So, and that's what I want this is. And I'm going to kind of describe what it is I want to do. Um, something that isn't widely appreciated about amateur radio from the perspective of non-amateurs is that you've got incredible freedom. You know, you can basically get away with doing darn near anything you want. You know, if you have an idea about wireless, you know, and you want to experiment, you're a really talented engineer, software, hardware, <coughs> RF, digital signal processing, anything. You know, the, there are so many people out there in the electronics industry that don't understand that, you know, anything anything conceivable that they would want to do, they can get away with on amateur radio. Just transmit a call sign with it. Don't try and make money blatantly with it. <laughs> And you can do whatever you want. And you can get lots of other people. And the really savvy tech companies understand this. They, they, they start deploying systems. They get their engineers licensed on amateur radio and they start deploying this stuff and quietly testing it out. And the other cool thing is you, if you find a few of your souls that want to play, boy, it is just a community. Um, and you can have and you're part of an interesting community. I mean, there, you know, the, there's all kinds of tech communities that take pride in their lunatic fringe. Uh, you know, sport aircraft comes to mind, photography. <coughs> We've got ours. You know, boom dots. How can you possibly justify boom dots? <laughs> and the expeditions, and, and, you know, and trying to work the world with a quarter watt, you know, that sort of stuff. So it's just, I, I, I love quoting. I'll probably never do much of it, but I kind of love quoting it. Um, but there is a real problem with amateur radio right now and, and networking. Network, we saw it first in networking, networking kind of went away, and then amateur radio starting to go away. That from my perspective, from what I've seen, and I'm not making a study of it, I'm not trying to promote it, I'm not trying to downplay it, I'm just trying to accurately convey what I've observed, is that it isn't growing in any relevant measure and few, very few young folks are coming in because they can't see the relevance of what it is we do. Um, it's not cool, it's not interesting. Even, in, and what, what really has amazed me and what's really sad me and, and is that I tried to talk about amateur radio to some of these wireless guys that, you know, the wireless ISPs and the, the wireless experimenters, the guys that love playing with wireless, they, they love playing with Wi-Fi and trying to form community networks and try and make wings to work over a mile. Ooh, imagine that. Um, and I talked to them about amateur radio, and they said, eh, nah. I can do anything I want with Wi-Fi and the internet. I don't have any content restrictions. I don't have any old farts breathing down my neck for inappropriate use, blah, blah, blah. So, and, and then the media is a little bit guilty about this. So, you know, they're, they're not going to positively portray something, you know, that they don't see in actual life. So the, the image I've seen in all of the amateur radio movies is, you know, the prototypical old white guy sitting in the basement tapping up. <coughs> and so, in my role as an observer, not actually being part of this, but trying to keep an eye on things, which is all I had time to do when, you know, in raising a daughter, trying to become a writer, is that there was really incredible innovation going on. Just amazing stuff that just blew me away when I would stumble onto it. But what happened was I would find these niches. And within the niche, everybody was really communicating well, you know. The satellite guys, you know, there's this whole subset of amateur radio. That's, you know, there's a lot of guys that consider amateur, you know, satellite work the you know, only relevant part of amateur radio. And they communicate incredibly well. There's the AMSAT DB mailings. Oh my god, talk about a floodgate. And uh, the AMSAT Journal and you know AMSAT does an incredible job. Right? You know, they're one silo, one community in many. The HF the HF communications guys are, are the same way. They, you know, it's incredible what they've done with the sound card and the PSK-31 and all the very, you know, very old elite. Um, but again, they, they only communicate within their 
specialty. And occasionally you'll get a drip and a drab and you know the occasional paragraph in QST. The QRP guys, same way. Lots of incredible innovation there, but you know, they, there's no way to track this stuff for a general audience. So yeah, no, this is the talk I've been or the thesis I've been doing for over the years. What I really want to do is write a book from my perspective talking about all this incredible innovation and tying it together in one, you know, kind of one package, which is, which is, which goes back to my work, what I do, I try to, I try to do for eight years now of, of writing about broadband wireless internet access. I see broadband wireless internet access as one big picture that includes everything from satellite to cellular to metropolitan Wi-Fi <coughs> to um, broadband wireless, you know, the service providers. I see, the, I see that as a whole industry. And I see all of this digital communication stuff involving in amateur radio as one big hole. That, but if I try to, if you if you try to talk to a satellite guy about what's going on in HF, et etc., they, they see them. They don't see. They see themselves as one one community, not part of a bigger picture. And they don't do a very good job of trying to communicate where they fit themselves into the big picture. So I developed this thesis, I call it a unified vision of amateur radio network. That there are there are all these fascinating, interesting applications and services, but that when they are um, when you're just one mode of mode or application, that's okay, that's interesting for the people that are into that. But there's also all the other parts that really need to be, so I wanted to see it as all. I want I wanted to be able to do satellite, and I want to be able to do HF, and I wanted to be able to do VHF, and all that stuff. And I want to do all the different types of things, the APRS, the messaging, the, you know, the instant messaging, <coughs> applications, the file transfers, et cetera. So, if, and I think, and this is the thesis that I kind of developed with, with Ed over the years, in those messages and, and just thinking about it a lot is that I think that they, if you did, if, if amateur radio could tie all of these digital things together in one package, in one approach, in one way of looking at it, all this stuff, you would really have something to talk about for the young techies. You could see, you could show them, oh, you're in high speed data. How, 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 how fast would you like to go? How much spectrum would you like to have? be able to play. Um, how, long, how far would you like to go? Um, how ubiquitous would you like the communication to be? And then, you know, when there's a big, there was a big buzz in the broadband wireless industry about the 700 megahertz options, you know. And, wow, you know, the big winner was, uh, I believe it was Verizon Wireless. They got what's called the C-Block, which was two television channels. Wow. They paid billions of dollars for 12 megahertz. <laughs> just on UHF, just you know, we've got 30 megahertz to play at 440. So, you know, they talk about the wonderful, the wonders of being able to penetrate buildings. You know, wow, you know, how much would 100 watts on a repeater do? So, um, one of the things that I evolved, or one of the thoughts I evolved, was that Linux was one of the Ways that all this stuff can be tied together. Just take a moment here. Yeah, burst into flames. Now, I'm turning on a Linux system, so if a missile comes flying out of the wall, <laughs> I'm trying to turn on a Linux system. Do you have Vista installed on there yet, Steve? <laughs> Apparently, I'm not going to turn on the system. I don't think Linux works in this building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this wasn't good. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so, my, my roots were right in the Ross era. Okay. Um, and I saw what all of the things that you could do with DOS and the, the TNC platform. And I watched. How much you know? I, I was part of how frustrating it was to try and make things work with DOS, the limitations of DOS and the limitations of the TNC platform. If they didn't want to put something on a mountaintop, 
didn't want to put a valuable PC or an unreliable PC was, was a bigger issue um, up there. So he wanted to try and make it work with the TNC. Oh boy, that was a challenge. So we tried to get, a, we, we worked so hard to get around those limitations. But Linux, the, the evolution of Linux fixed all of that. That was cheap. You could do wonders on basic hardware, 3 and 6 hardware and weapons. And you had all the utilities that you know you could possibly ask for, the stuff that we had hacked into, you know, JNOS over the years, trying to run made, you know, the DOS, DOS into a real network system. But what was really cool about Linux is it had networking, it had all those networking widgets built in. And uh, Phil Karn predicted all of this when he wrote Net and DOS. He said this was this is just a bridge. This just gets us, you know, halfway there. To the, until the time that everybody sits at home with a full-blown network-capable operating system, you know, and his, he was into Unix way back when, and you know, finally we're there with Windows and Mac OS and, and Linux. So, but what I came to realize is that Linux is really tough to handle, especially now. We've got a population that you know never had to deal with loss. So it has to be click, point and click. So some of the good that I thought that Linux was, uh, some of the good that I thought um, for Linux was the fact that it did require very few resources, but that was the non-GUI non versions. Get, and getting drivers to work on questionable hardware, making it, keeping it updated, configured, et cetera. So, what really kicked, what really kind of brought everything that I talked about, you know, the, those thoughts over the years that really brought things into focus was this little device. This is called the One Laptop and Child XO. And there's one of them, so I'm going to get to play peer to peer networking today somehow. Um, all the power of Linux, this is all based on Linux. It's got, you know, and, and it's Linux baked in. It's, you know, comes out of the chute with Linux. You get to the command line, there's all kinds of stuff buried under, under the GUI. Now, this is, there's a lot of compromises in this. This is a, this is a laptop that's designed for children who have no, has never, ever, never seen a computer. So the GUI is weird. I'll just say it. The keyboard is weird. It's, you know, you cannot touch type, if you are an adult, you cannot touch type on this at all. And I don't think even if a child can touch type on this, it's not something that you're going to write novels on. Unless you use an external keyboard. But it was, what was really cool to me and what really kind of made it made me think that what my that vision I had of you know this integrated system of amateur radio, all the digital communications things, was that it was standardized. That if hands were to buy this or something like this, it would it would just work. It was Linux, you know, it was, it was about plug and play Linux. <coughs> Um, it's rugged. Oops. <laughs> I, I can't prove that it still works because it didn't turn on. Well, but it, it suffered no physical damage. <laughs> hard drive is toast. Oh, oh, cool. Hard drive. Nope, no hard drive. Okay. So um, it's, it's got what, what it does. What it does have is a SD slot, eight gigabytes or so right now, maybe more, I don't know how big it can be. Eats 12 volts direct, low power consumption, three USB ports, uh, audio in and out, but enhanced range so that you could do things like plug thermocouples and all kinds of instrumentation widgets into it. Yes, I have mine too, all multi plug. I didn't think to check it when I bought it, when I got it back from them, my friend. Ran it um, let's see. Oh, and of course they, and it's cheap. This is the goal was ninety nine was was a hundred dollar laptop. It actually came out to one hundred eighty eight dollars. So, and what's really cool is that this this breaks some new ground in laptop technology that nobody else has yet. It, the Wi Fi is got a mesh mode, so if you don't have any infrastructure at all. You got two of these. They can communicate with each other. And you can communicate with the server in the classroom, which has the big hard disk, you know, the 100 gigabyte hard disk. 
Um, it has an integrated, the display is readable in sunlight. It's the very first one that can do that. That was a, that was a breakthrough. So this is a good device for putting in your car. But then I had, a, I had this chat with my friend Bill. He's a good friend. Um, Bill has this quality of, if you really want to know what he thinks, he's, he's really blatant this way, that he'll tell you what he really thinks. And uh, don't go to him if you want your assumptions and biases unchallenged, like mine was with Linux. Um, he has the ability that he got to stay, he was able to stay active in amateur radio network, and he's also a skilled Linux geek. And he listened to me patiently, you know, spelling on all the time <coughs> over many, many talking sessions at Kelly's, and uh, patiently just forming my arguments at Kelly's. So I've come around. I think I, he says, he, his thesis is that Windows is the you know, Linux, again, you know, I was using Linux as the unifying glue for all this stuff that I'd seen in amateur radio evolving. This point is the Windows, you know, Windows is the environment, you know, it's, so just get over it and move on. Plenty capable, you know, I, I, again, I had some biases from the battle days of DOS and the early versions of Windows. But, you know, the script, another, one thing I really loved about Linux was that you could script anything. You could make it do anything with, you know, just gluing it together with all the script, these scripting languages. Bill says, they're there. He's right. Um, it's reliable enough. Um, it's usable by the average hand. Everybody knows how to use Windows now. And what really, one of, one of the arguments for the discussion in favor of Bill's point was that all the stuff I'm going to talk about, all the stuff that's out there now, it's already there for Windows. It's already there. Just, you know, so all the pieces are there. Just now the job is to glue them all together and make it usable and impressive and cool. So I have to offer this disclaimer. Despite this venue, I did not come to this conclusion to please the Microsoft, the Microsoft user, Microsoft user, Microsoft and this was a hard conclusion for me to come to, that Windows is the way to go here. Um, and point taken, I'm going to move on. And the thing was, I, I could either rail against Windows, doing things on Windows, and try and make it work on Linux, and spend a lot of time and energy and finding a way, but, or I could get on with it and start doing the fun stuff using Windows. So, and the second disclaimer that I think is really important. I have not used much of this stuff. I've explained what, you know, that I've been busy tracing <laughs> about it. So, uh, you know, you're going to hear some really ignorant things come out of my mouth about the program that the, the systems I'm about to discuss. And I'm going to be sitting here taking notes for the rest of the day, for the rest of the day. Because I'm here to learn and I want to get going on this stuff. So, We'll start talking about the pieces and then I'll describe the integration that I hope to see in the fall. Okay, one of, the, one of the things that we've always wanted to do is amateur radio email. And I kept talking to Bill about this and you know, really going on and on about how I would be in Bill and you know, another one of these patient moments waiting for when I was vulnerable and zooming and said, airmail. Just airmail is the, the email program, the default email program system, you know, it works as part of Winlink. And he, you know, I said, yeah, it's, it's closed, you know, it's closed, you know, it's Windows, it's, you know, it's not very well supported, but it says, yeah, but it works. Yeah, but it works. Yeah, but it works. Okay. You know, American. So, that's one, so that was, the, that was one of the pieces that we need, you know, this fantasy system I'm, I'm going to describe. You know, if you want to if you want to do amateur radio to amateur radio email, just get air mail and get on with it. Uh, APRS was another thing that I saw evolve over time. Um, that I was think I, I had all these. I you know as I gradually grew, I understood what APRS was all about. I had this fantasy ideas and. Some, and there were some interesting things being done on Linux, but then apparently all the momentum shifted to this program called UIView for APRS and running on Windows. And 
all those things that I wanted, I imagined I could, I wanted to do using the APRS infrastructure. Apparently, you have you got. Again, I haven't used it yet. I'm, all the stuff I'm very much looking forward to getting, you know, going in my in my radio room, testing off the TNCs, doing the smoke test. And some of them haven't been on for more than ten years, and getting the stuff actually going. And one of the things that I, that I think is really cool that hasn't been really appreciated about APRS is that there's a short message capability, just like what we do the text messaging that we do on our phones. Better. So that's one thing I'm really looking forward to doing. Short messaging worldwide, BSK31, these chat systems on HF and these digital. And I, you know, I, 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 I briefly tried to track you know, track down how many of there were. I lost count after a dozen. And this is just and this is just been amazing to me how much, you know, at first I was really skeptical. You know, how much can you really do with a sound blaster card? The trouble was, it wasn't, it wasn't Sound Blaster cards, it was stuff that got better and better and better, you know, way, way beyond Sound Blaster cards. So now they're actually making, you know, sound cards that are designed for this kind of application now. That, you know, work in an ordinary PC. Um, amateur radio voice, well, you know, wow, you could do voice messaging, you know, over amateur radio. But, you know, there, it would be really cool if I could be chatting with my people that aren't in my immediate area back in my hometown in Ohio and on those repeaters. And this is another thing I, I think ought to be part of the package that I want to add. It's called Echolink. Um, digital voice is another really fascinating application. Not so much that you're just digitizing voice, but that all the things that go along with the digital voice, for example, Every time you put it in on a D-Star, if you're using a digital voice mode, every time you transmit, your call sign goes out as part of the, the digital data stream. That's really cool because you can start doing things like, I want to know when some of my buddies are on the air on a particular, and what repeater they're hanging out on, so I can, you know, if I want to just find out where they are and where the conversations are, I, I, can, I can know now. Before, you had to monitor a whole bunch of repeaters and you wouldn't necessarily catch them. Um, that's for P25. Uh, P25 is a, the, the uh, two-way radio industries, or the public safety industry, you know, appropriately, um, implementation of digital uh, voice, but they, they were very, they were, all of the two-way radio, all of the big three two-way radio companies were implementing their own proprietary digital voice, and the public safety community did not want to go down that road. So the Association of Chiefs of Police. I think police communications officers. Thank you. Um, public safety communications officers. Um, they created a standard for digital voice that has taken at least one decade, maybe two, to actually evolve into interoperable radios that you can buy now. So, um, and I was, I was in one of those things, wouldn't it be cool if amateur radio was doing this? And Another coffee conversation with Bill just demolishing that system. Check. 30 being done. So APCO or the P25 radio is already on the air for amateur radio applications. That would be really good. Um, and, the, and, and I think the best part about digital voice, at least the way uh, ICOM or the uh, D Star implements it, is that there's interleaved with the digital voice packet or, or stream is data streams. So you can do things like every time you push the mic. You can get uh, a GPS fix, you know, latitude longitude data from your GPS. Uh, some networking, you know, let your your computers talk between each other. D Star is here. Um, been here for what five years now. Um, it is 128 kilobits per second, but it's half duplex. Um, Icon did a lot wrong, especially with the networking. And they did pillory for it, and uh, we, this was all pointed out way back. And they fixed some things, but at least they tried. And then what they did was create a turnkey radio that you know is Ethernet jack on the back of the radio. Kudos for that, and it works. And you can buy it off the shelf, turn it on, you know, put an antenna on it, and it works. And and one of the better things about we haven't really been able to do 
other than a 1200 watt, is to make it work mobile. Mesh networking is all the rage now in the broadband wireless internet access industry, and, and, in some, and we'll see it evolve into laptops in the very near future. It's called the 2.11S, and it's still one of those standards that's in the final stages of development. So this is another thing that we did, we led way early. Um, I assume you all remember NetRon if you were back in active back when. It, it, it was mesh network. It had all the key aspects of mesh network. Um, and what was really frustrating was that those poor little TNCs just did not have enough memory to try and keep all the routing tables. And I mean, you could figure out what the what good routes were but, you know, from the historical data. You know that some routes, you know, popped in, only stayed good for an hour or two in the evening when the ducting was working, and they would fade out. But the trouble was the algorithms weren't so you, the algorithms that you could execute in that poor little TNC weren't sophisticated enough and you couldn't store exceptions like that because you did, just didn't have enough memory. So now all that stuff, all those issues are gone. We've got we've got incredibly powerful little uh, embedded computers that just sit power. We've got how many gigabytes of, of storage would you like? We've got Buku processor power. So we can do all this stuff better, much, much better than we could then. With, with no real increase in the, the technology of, of that era, other than better a better platform, but we haven't. We have lots of digit repeaters for APRS. We have lots of audio-only repeaters. They're very, very quiet. What is the point of having a repeater if nobody uses it? We have a snap smattering that again and again. I'm just an observer, you know, a very imperfect observer of all this stuff. But you know, the packet network is very really quiet, except for APRS. So here's the, here comes the meat of the topic. What I want to be able to do is go into my radio room at night and have a console sitting there that tells me what's going on in my area and what's going on in the world of amateur radio, the stuff that I want to know about. I want to be able to you know, bring up a window with call, and type in a call button and click on, a, click on something, and I wanted to tell me what's going on with my friends. You know, have where, where is my is anybody close to me? Has anybody you know, done anything interesting? Where where are they at the moment? Um, if they're available for a chat, if they're in their chat, if they're mobile, you know, etc. All these things, you know, kind of all this, this magic way to communicate. They've been heard on a repeater with Echo Lake or, or a V-Star. Or and see any emails or messages that I have with them. And if I want to send a message to them, I want that link to be really easy to you know, just click and go and type. And it gets routed to them however. Win link over a short message capability for APRS. Um, file transfers if I have a direct link to them via TCP IP or D star. And if I want to look something up on their station, you know, figure something out. I know that they're working on a project and see if they have any progress. I want to look at I want to look at their web page. So they're being done. I want to do all this over amateur radio. Uh, here's where it starts getting really interesting. Um, and I'll, I want to really acknowledge that this was not my idea. I was just blown away when I saw this. Ken Coster and Southern IPD put together this package that really sparked my imagination. It really has been one of the key things that I've seen that gets really interesting. He called it JeepNet because I don't remember what kind of Jeep he had. But it was a Jeep. And he had this pile of stuff in the back seat. And he had a bad, dedicated battery back there. He wired it up to parallel charge it. Um, there was, he, he's gone through a succession of computers sitting back running Linux. And he had his HF radio, his VHF radio, and APRS, the GPS, the, they all fed into this one computer. And then there was this really cool thing that he added to it that, was, that I thought was really, really cool. He put a Linksys access point in the back, in, in there with it. So he pulled up, he pulled up his car to a restaurant when we were having a packet meeting. And he'd bring his laptop in, but nothing else. And he'd sit there and he'd communicate, connect up with his, his uh, computer in his, in his vehicle, 
and you have full capability of all of those things, you know, over the Wi-Fi, full bandwidth, you know, if you needed to pull up a, a file or something like that, off, and this is a totally um, uh, stock laptop, you know, nothing, nothing special. Oh, he preferred to run Linux on it. Um, but a lot of the stuff he saw was actually from a web browser. You know, so he was looking at you know, his control of the, of the GPS computer from a web browser, which all kinds of interesting possibilities. Um, one of, but one of the things he didn't try to do is that he didn't really implement any NetRom capability. And that's one of the things that I, that was one of the things that occurred to me that would be really is if each one of these jeep nets, if we, you know, if we started building jeep nets, you know, every, every ham started building a jeep net, why not put uh, NetROM or its successor into the, into the mix so that, again, this is mesh networking, so, you know, if they come within range of each other and discover each other, wow, they start meshing up, you know, all of a sudden I know what the capabilities are, you know, he might have a high-speed internet connection in his vehicle. Uh, he might have a, you know, and, and the, the capabilities are in it. Um, we, should, and he, we should be doing a better job of using Wi-Fi. The, the OLPC has built-in mesh networking on over Wi-Fi. We should be able to implement that, and there are some ways to do that now. Um, we should, you know, there's, there's plenty of data out there. We, you know, it's, if Ken, one of the things, one of the things that makes sense to share and be part of a community, the one thing that we can't cache very easily is these huge map files. So why not keep, if you've got a, if you want to invest in a ruggedized, big hard disk that survives in a vehicle, you know, share out the maps. Um, and then you start talking about Jeep nets talking to home nets. And again, this is good. <laughs> If it comes home, your Jeep net syncs up with your home system and catches up with everything that it needs to transfer. Um, or you can, or if you're visiting somewhere, um, another hand, it checks in with the <coughs> home station and it synchronizes and says, oh, you have some interesting stuff here. Automatically caches and transfers. And this, this, this so APRS has already done some of this stuff. Like auto discover, you know, you drive to a new city and you get to auto discover all the resources. You know, you get to download the list of the local repeaters and all the PL you code. Know, and some of the stuff ought to automatically transfer your radio if you want. You reserve one bank for the local, you know, the, the new local repeaters in there. This is all essentially scripting. Um, the power of all the things that we can do, all these disparate things, is in being able to do all of those things. You know, it's not just the of being able to do any of these things that we want to be able to do. But a lot of times we can't because we don't know enough about it. So we ought to be doing a better job of communicating all these things that we can do. Not just to ourselves, but also to the outside world. And we ought to be able to show it off show off all these things that we can do in a unified way. You know, you won't turn everybody on by being able to show them the awesomeness of being able to do satellite communication. You won't turn everybody on by being able to do HF. If you could show them the whole spectrum of what all the things we can do, oh, they start to get the picture. That gets powerful and really impressive and end all of it. You start seeing all the capabilities that, we, that are inherent in amateur radio and that starts to become relevant to them. And again, doing all this stuff with the amateur radio, totally independent of you know, the commercial infrastructure, but doing all the cool stuff that they're used to doing with the commercial infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to rush to these because I can see that I'm pushing on time. Um, I'm sorry to do part of the shots, but I'm not going to be sorry to <laughs> Um, we do it, we consider that we are supposed to be all about communicating between each other. I mean, one ham radio operator talking into the void is not a communication. Um, we, we don't do a very good job of Elmer anymore. And we need to do a better job of that. We need to be able to expose 
other people you know, that don't have any exposure to ham radio and nurture them along. We don't communicate very well externally. We need to be able to let them find us. <coughs> um, where's where's MySpace for amateur radio? Some would argue it's is it Q QSL.net, there's others. The AWL, we've got all these silos. Everybody chooses one, you know. But you, you can't get the, you can't find everybody on any one site. Um, and we should do a better job of that for local radio. You know, there ought to be Seattle.hamradio.com, etc. You know, a listing of all of the people in Seattle, all the hands in Seattle, what they're into. <coughs> An amateur radio Wikipedia, that would be really good. Um, amateur radio magazines, this is a, a railing point of mine, and I'm probably as guilty of this as anybody else, but you know, we locked up a lot of our institutional knowledge in magazines that are <laughs> molding away. We, you know, on, the, on a lot of this information that, we, that was so precious to us, that was so hard developed, and yet it's just atrophying in, in paper, you know, slowly dying away, and it's not, you know, I just had a, discu a long discussion about um, how people find information anymore, and, and the kids of today, you know, basically their, their primary way of finding information is figuring out how to find the, the query, do a query in Google. And if it isn't on the web, but, you know, for them, a lot of times it just doesn't exist. And school systems are fighting a rear guard action on that, trying to get them to use encyclopedias and other sources. But you know, when they want to find something that's of interest to them, they Google it. And if they don't find it on Google, if they don't, you know, if they don't find a link on Google to a web page, it, doesn't, it isn't there. So, we, we amateur radio as a group has done a really bad job of locking information up that ought to be public. Um, another railing point of mine is R&D funding, and I watched this develop. I watched this play out very, very sadly on a project for Tapper called the Frequency Hopping Spread Spectrum Radio. This is a brilliant idea. It was it was groundbreaking in its day. It, it would do things that nobody else had done. It was developed for magnitude 928 because that's where the, the cheap chipsets were. It would have been an ideal way for spread spectrum to have found its way into amateur radio. Could have evolved into an entire family of radio. The problem was is that there wasn't a budget for it. So a brilliant engineer named Tom McDermott um, built it up over years. The trouble was it took way too long to develop it. By the time he was getting close to you know figuring out all of, all the bugs and you know, creating a new one, a good one, you know, the, the final version, the manufacturers obsoleted the parts because they're on one year time cycles for the cellular industry now, and the stuff that Tom had built, you know, the entire design was built around, the chipsets that were, the entire design was built around, were no longer available for production, even if, you know, even if it was done. So you can't do these big projects anymore for ham radio on, amateur, on an amateur time unit basis. So there has to be some way to get some funding to be able to do the professional engineering full time, get, get a, Get a design, design tested, and actually into production in time cycles that are compatible with the industry as it is now. And we don't have anybody who's willing to offer that venture capital right now, the patient venture capital. And just as an example, what, what would have happened if back in the day when Wi-Fi was really coming up, we had a cheap 2.4 gigahertz to 1.2 gigahertz transverter and power amplifier? What could we have done? Uh, you had 60 megahertz of spectrum at 1.2 megahertz. Um, another, another example of if we had some money, if there was some money, the cheapest, most capable wireless <coughs> data device is a DOCSIS cable motor. You know, 100 bucks, but they, imagine what that thing does. You know, it works from DC to daylight. It um, you know, pushes megabits of information through relatively small channels, maybe 6 megahertz. And guess what? It, tuned, it would quite happily tune to amateur radio frequencies. So, what if we could adapt that? You know, we could have adapted that. Um, the, the money that I'm talking about, the R&D funding, just has to pay for the, the non-recurring engineering expenses. Once there, is, once there is a design, there seems to be no shortage of people who are willing to push it out. Look what happened with MFJ and TNC2. You know, 
They're, they'll take it and run from it, you know, but they can't recoup those, you know, those very onerous non-recurring engineering expenses. And that has to be paid for somehow, and why not some kind of R&D funding? Uh, another idea, my last idea, is to buy the ricochet system. Not, you know, and, and the technologies and, and use that for amateur. We've still got thousands of ricochet nodes hanging on, chirping away, doing absolutely nothing here. But guess what? They're on 902 to 928. Um, their frequency hopping spread spectrum on that, on that band. They've got 2.4 gigahertz backhaul. And for a relatively modest investment, because it's commercially useless now, um, we could end up owning, you know, enough of the technology <coughs> <laughs> deploy them in, you know, at least a dozen major cities. There's literally a warehouse full of gear sitting in Denver, bowling away for five, five plus years now. Um, besides some of the stuff that I talked about today, you know, previously, um, there are some other cool stuff. Asterisk, um, basically a phone switch in a PC. Really, really cool stuff. And basically, anything you can imagine you want to do with voice, Asterisk will help you do it. It was designed originally as a phone switch. It's morphed into much, much more than that. Um, I want, I'll want to do D-Star. As, as critical as I was of it early on, it's the only thing really going there, and I want to, I don't want to start playing. So I'm going to be I, a little steep of an investment right now, but eventually I'll be able to do it. Um, I'm going to put as much of my TNC collection on here as I can, even if it means they wouldn't build a computer. One user. Um, virtualization is a, is a really cool thing if you haven't been exposed to that. Um, basically, virtualization partitions your computer, not just the operating system, you know, running multiple applications under the same operating system, <coughs> but partitions the physical part of the computer that you can run as many different operating systems. So if there's one thing you want to do with Linux and you just don't want to fuss with it, you, know, you can actually get these uh, downloads that you just install the virtualization software and then it's, boom, the application's there and running and you don't have to fuss with it anymore. You didn't have another box, you didn't have to have another box in your shack, but it just sits there and does the utility work in the background. And, and, and also, um, if you run them on the applications that were written for, say, Windows 98, but never operated to be able to work with um, XP or Vista, that's easily done too. Um, and I'm going to be writing all this stuff down as I go. And here are some references, just some basic references. Um, and uh, my name, I, I've neglected to put my email address. It's steve at stevestro.net if you want to get an answer from me. And my gosh, I am happy to talk to you about any of this. So, that's it. broken, they're bringing in another one. Um, hopefully it'll be here by lunchtime, I apologize for that. 